We have a really, really special guest today, and her name is Kathy Masayoka, um, and I'll be bringing her on. I'm excited to have her. Um, this is a real, real treat, real honor to have her. Hi, Tammy. Um, and I think that we're going to bring Oh, hi, Kathy. Hi. Hi, Sam. Um, I was just about to give a quick introduction of you. Okay. Uh, and then we're going to hop into the live. And so we're going to also let, uh, that way allow for a couple people to, all right. Uh, I think you have to X out of the, um, the, okay. I think we're good. So everybody, we're really, really lucky to have Kathy. Um, Kathy has been fighting the good fight for, for quite some time now. And um, we had a call the other day and unbelievable amount of learning that I, I experienced. And I'm oh, so blessed to have you. Um, and so I just want to give us uh, a very quick, um, before I forget, because I'm so excited to have this conversation, I needed to make a quick shout out, but important shout out to Next Shark and Admirasia. Um, they have teamed up to create a map. And that map is actually an interactive map in which you can go in and to your local areas, find which small black owned businesses you can support. Oh, so I highly good. recommend you check out that map. It's literally called Map. Go check it out so you can help and, and put, put your money where your mouth is and really support the black, black community in all ways. So that's a great way to contribute. Also, the shirt that I have here, Hate is a Virus, you can get on, um, we, we are Uprisers. And so now on to my introduction of our special guest, Kathy Masayoka. Kathy was born and raised in multicultural Boyle Heights and had a coming of age in the late 60s. During the Vietnam War and the Asian, and during the Vietnam War and Asian American studies at UC Berkeley were important influences on her values and direction. And since 1971, she has worked on issues related to youth, workers, housing in Little Tokyo, and redress. And she is currently the co-chair of the Nikkei, if I am pronouncing that correctly, or I'm Nikkei. 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 Uh -huh. Nikkei for civil rights and redress. And she served on the editorial team for the book NCRR, the Grassroots Struggle for Japanese American Redress and Rep Reparations. And I, I could keep on going on and on and on with her, but I, I don't want to keep talking. I really want to bring uh, Kathy on and so allow Kathy. Kathy, could you please give a introduction of yourself? Tell us a little bit about your journey, where who you are, where you grew up, and to kind of set the tone and to provide some context for this conversation. Okay. Thanks, Sam. Uh, thank you to Hate is a Virus, too. Um, well, you know, I think there are I'm a third generation American Sansei. And I think several things really influenced me in my path. And I think one is being born in Ball Heights and being raised there in an environment that was, um, you know, many different cultures and, and um, different kinds of people. And because it was post-war, people were kind of all in the same boat at that time. Not a lot of money, working class people. And people supported each other, helped each other out. And I and pretty much saw each other as the same. And I learned a lot from that kind of environment. Of course, another big influence was being born to uh, a families and families that had been in the camp, had been incarcerated during World War II. Uh, although they never spoke about it, it was definitely a strong influence and impact on my life because I think the messages that we heard, though not understanding why, was, you know, we have to really do well. We have to be um, uh, education was important. We have to try to fit in, uh, you know, just subtle, also subtle messages that kind of came across growing up that we didn't really quite understand until later, you know, but never really knowing what it meant to be Japanese. You know what I mean? It's like, I wasn't necessarily proud and I knew that, you know, so those were, those are, could go on and on about that too, but, um, that was really an important influence. I think going to UC Berkeley at the time uh, in the late 60s was definitely a strong influence. Uh, you know, a time of a lot of activity, a lot of activism, a lot of learning for me, coming from a very sheltered Japanese American um, you know, elementary school to almost an all white high school, all girls uh, to UC Berkeley and seeing, uh, you know, the Vietnam War, uh, you know, and then, of course, the Third World Strike. I happened to be in Japan in 1968 and 69. And, you know, like a lot of us, we were trying to find our identity, right? I didn't feel like I had a place in America. 
And uh, when I came back, I was just really overjoyed. Uh, and the answer was Asian American studies. So for me, that changed my life. And I, I felt like I was on a path uh, and a direction, you know, coming back to Los Angeles and working in the Japanese American community. So that's kind of the early path to getting active and, and involved. And that's incredible. And, and I think that's something that many of us are still struggling, I think, for myself. I can only speak for myself, but that's figuring out my identity as an Asian American has been a really you know, arduous journey and, and kind of like coming back and, and reclaiming my heritage. And was that, you know, I think for young Asian Americans right now, like a lot of whitewashing and, and that feeling of having to fit in, that still exists. So mm. was, was that term around back when you were growing up or was that something that you heard as you got older? Well, you know, there was no concept of Asian American, right, before uh, ethnic studies in 1968-69. So um, it was either you were white or you were other, you know, Japanese or whatever you might have been. Whitewashing, yeah, I guess, you know, in the 60s, yes, people were trying to be white, banana, or, or those kind of terms, Is that, if that's what you mean. Yes, right. I mean, that, that was there. Um, you know, we didn't have a lot of a lot of choices you know what i mean it's um so going to japan i really tried to become japanese and this is kind of funny because you really can't become you can't become something else you know i, I was trying really hard and it's a very difficult culture to um to fit into even if you lived there probably 50 years but uh it was impossible so i really felt very doomed you know coming back and not knowing yet about asian american studies and the movement I, I felt like totally lost, like there was nothing else here. But I feel really happy. There is Asian American studies. There are, there are alternatives for all of you, you know. I think that at least that has been developed and created. And, uh, I, I, you know, I think there are choices and alternatives and a direction for people. So could you actually talk a little bit more about that? Is when, you know, you talked about how the Asian American term was actually created in the early part of your life, lifetime. So... What was that feeling like during that time? Because for most of us who are watching, who are younger, we've always known of that term. That's just kind of, when we're born here, we, just, we are Asian American. But what does it feel like to go from not having that term and that label to all of a sudden now you're, you're lumped under as Asian American? I, and I can't even describe it. It was like, um, I really hated being almost around other Japanese Americans or Asian Americans, you know, because I felt like, something was wrong with that or like you know it was like not as secure if you have to hang out in a group and so i i really avoided that but after asian american studies and asian american identity it was like no i want to be part of this i wanted i felt good about being who i was and i wanted and i felt good about other other asian americans which was very sad that i felt the other way before you know but i saw and i, I saw a connection i saw that we were we had you know similar struggles and similar issues and that, you know, of course, uh, the Vietnam War brought us together as far as, you know, seeing that kind of war against Asian people and how people were looking at us. Um, you know, so I think that was also a very strong unifying force for, for us as Asian Americans. Um, yeah, I, I can't even describe how the, it felt like it saved my life, to be honest. You know, it was, uh, and I think a lot of people felt that way. Uh, we felt strong, we felt good. Um, you know, we, we of course had uh, gathered strength from other, other groups of people, you know, civil rights movement we learned about and, you know, the, black is beautiful. We, now we knew that yellow, being yellow was beautiful. Um, but, you know, our, our understanding wasn't very deep because none of us had learned about our history. It wasn't like we knew much. Not much was written at that time. There were a few books, but uh, most of us didn't know about the camps, you know. And we didn't know about that history. We didn't know what our people had done here or had accomplished. So all of that was to be developed, really, and to be written about and to be learned. So can you actually talk about your, that history, right? When you're at UC Berkeley and there was that Asian American studies, but also there wasn't much literature or studies done yet. Because, so could you actually talk about learning about Asian American studies at that time? Okay, well, I have to be honest, I was 1916, no, was it 1969, and I was in, the, I think, the first Asian American Studies class, but it was a community class. And all of these classes were taught by students, because you didn't have people with PhDs in Asian American Studies, because it hadn't existed before. 
So you had classes that were really taught like learning on the ground. We were going to San Francisco. We were learning from people in the community, or we were hearing speakers from LA. You know, so that was kind of the learning that we did. Uh, I didn't really learn about the history until I came back to LA, heard from people, and really learned the history from listening to people. We didn't have necessarily the books. We were, you know, hungry. For Books, you know, the poetry, the other writings that started to come out. We listened to people read their poetry or we went to, went to Manzanar, the pilgrimages, to the camps and heard the older people talk about the camps. Uh, not, not our own parents necessarily, but from other people. So I don't want to say that my learning really was book learning. And uh, I want to say that Asian American Studies opened the door to that, uh, you know, that, that there was this richness that, you know, I was yet to learn, really, and that, that, we, that we were a people, that we had a, a definite history here uh, and had contributed. I didn't know all the details. And, you know, the, the Asian API community at that time was really majority Japanese, Chinese, and Filipino, at least in L.A. And uh, so, you know, we kind of learned from each other, you know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, Inter interactive learning and how people what people are doing and sharing mm. so I you know wasn't really reading books so much yeah mm. sounds like you're learning uh, the best way though by through actual talking to people and having discussion and discourse like what a foreign concept now I, I, I like guess although it might be kind of sketchy <laughs> My, my information, my education <laughs> may, may be a bit sketchy compared to people today who have studied a lot with Asian American studies yeah, I think you. I, I I'm just you know I know, you know we asked you not to look at the comments. I'm looking at the comments and people are blown away about what you're saying. These are these are this is information and nuggets of wisdom that we had no idea about. And I think for me, I was like there was a reckoning where I was like, oh, I'm Asian American, so I must know what it feels like to be Asian American. And then as I grew older, realizing that I my think Sam might be cutting out a bit, different. so I'm I'm missing your last question or comment. Oh, I, I said that being, I, I thought that being, because I was Asian American, that that meant that I understood and knew what it felt like to be Asian American, but I was wrong. That that was just my individual experience, but everybody has a different experience based on their perspective and experiences and, and where they live. And, and so I would love to hear your journey through, from, from the time when you first started studying at UC Berkeley to where you are now and how you've evolved and, and your perception and conceptions of what it means to be Asian American. Hmm. Um, well, from someone that didn't know anything at all about being Asian American or um, not even liking being Asian American, uh, I've learned that, um, you know, that our history is really deep and rich, you know, in each community. And uh, I, you know, it's funny because through working on redress, uh, the campaign to get reparations and an apology for Japanese Americans. That was a 10 year struggle. That one was probably most significant in terms of impact on my learning because it, we learned so much about what people went through. And, you know, from a, from a scratching the surface to, you know, like the facts about 10 camps and to, to like, like the stories that we heard finally opened up and broke their silence in 1981 to throughout the campaign, we kept hearing more stories and we keep learning more. I mean, there's just, uh, just so much that keeps coming out. And I think that's probably true of every community. And I guess when I say this, I also feel very sad because, you know, in every community you have people that have passed away and those stories are gone, you know, and you will never have them again. So it's kind of capturing the stories of the older people is, is really important. You know, I regret not having spoken to my grandmother more or even my father more. You know, my grandmother only spoke Japanese, but um, even my father, I think that I could have learned more from. Uh, I, I think I've learned an appreciation for the people in our community and that history. Um, but I firmly believe that our history is here. You know, and, and you know, maybe I say that and I hope that's not a a sense of privilege because Japanese Americans have been here, you know, historically. We do have new immigrants, so I don't want to, you know, deny that. There's quite a significant population of new immigrants, too, from Japan. But I really 
I mean, while we come from Japan and there's many things that I appreciate and value about, uh, you know, Japan and things that, that、uh, we carry over, most of it is actually from a very old time, though, because we learned it from our grandparents. I, I value those things, but I also feel that our history is more deeply rooted here and what we've learned here, what we've struggled,、uh, and that our, our values come from that. You know, it's sort of like fighting for redress and,、um, you know, sharing our story with other communities, the rest of, of America, and people supporting us and learning about other struggles that were going on, I think has a longer lasting legacy, which means that we as Japanese Americans, I think, carry on that legacy and responsibility to support other people from what we went through, from what we learned. You know, so. I feel like those are the lessons that、um, I've learned by being involved, and that community is very important. You have to be rooted in your community. You know,、um, the, uh, I, I came back from college to Little Tokyo, and I really feel like I never left.、Mm. Uh, I don't have an office there, I don't necessarily work there or live there, but we feel like that is our center. And you know, it's very, very important to us to have that center. Even though our community is changing all the time, like we look different. You know, our, I mean, you know, so, the fourth generation, my children, the fifth generation, I have two grandkids that are, you know, that are different Asian you know, backgrounds, which is, you know, our community is very mixed. You know, cousins that are half white, you know, it's, so it's, it's just all over the place.、Um, but, That doesn't matter. You know, it's more like we, we do have a place that we're rooted and we,、um, we really you know, come from that strong grounding, I think, and in our history. I, I kind of, I don't I think I took it off from your question, Sam. No, no. I, see, every, here's the thing, Kathy. It's like everything you're saying is nuggets of wisdom and, and perspective that, that we don't have and we don't get a, a chance because. Not all of our you know, parents and grandparents grew up in the United States or were here fighting the fight, which actually leads me to my question is that you know, you've, you've seen the change a n d the fight for Asian Americans and our visibility shift. And, and what you were talking about was that you know, there are more generations and there's more so of an immigrant community now as well. And so, how do we communicate with those that are you know, not just inter, intergenerational, multi generational, but also? From different perspectives of maybe identifying more as American or identifying more as your ethnic、um, background, maybe whether it's Korean or Japanese or even Southeast, you know, Southeast Asian, like Kamai? Yeah,、um, I, I know that, you know, I don't know if we've done a good job of, of、uh, continuing that kind of solidarity, you know, and continuing to learn from each other and support each other. And- As our communities have changed, newer immigrants have come in,、uh, it's easy to not reach out or to try to build that solidarity. I think we have an opportunity now、um, because of everything that's going on, right? I think、um, we, but not, not just grouping together as one lump, but really trying to understand the distinction and differences. And, you know,、um, I am going to talk about the comfort women issue, for example. You know, it, it is an issue that has、uh, sometimes divides our community,、uh, you know, Japanese and Korean American community. And I think,、uh, you know, we all have to make an effort to, to understand each other's background and history and share that a little bit more. And, and、uh, you know, I have a lot to learn. And, and、um, you know, we want to share where we're coming from too because there's misunderstanding. But I think. And we have to work within our communities to try to break down those misunderstandings.、Uh, and I, I hope that now is an opportunity because we're talking about racism and how racism you know, divides us. Whereas if we're fighting racism together, hopefully it will bring us together. We're, we're all breaking down the same system, you know,、um, of the structure. And so, yeah,、uh, it's. It's still a lot of work to be done. I don't know if I have the answer to that. It's very comfortable to stay in your own circle, right? And there's a lot to do within your own community. But, you know, like、um, we're understanding more about even the Southeast Asian、um, 
people, men, uh, guy, you know, people that are facing deportation coming out of prison. And, you know, we've, we've heard about it before, but we've never really reached out and tried to do more. I think, again, the time, times have forced us to look at the prison system, uh, the, the immigration system, and uh, the support that's needed. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. That's yeah, beautiful. So. And, so, and I think a question that, you know, probably many of the viewers are really interested in hearing about, on, about your perspective is how do we speak to our older generation? How do we work with the older generation? Um, you know, because I, for example, here in Massachusetts, um, yeah, I'm, I'm here in Boston and I'm one of the Asian American commissioners. And one of the, the battles is that I hear from particularly those in the older generations, why the haste? Why do we have to move so quickly? Why do, it, why do we have to air our laundry, right? Why do we have to name anti-blackness? Why do we have to name, um, why, why, do we, why can't we do it behind closed doors? And could you speak to that mentality and where that comes from? Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny you're talking about that. It's like when I was first involved in, in uh, Little Tokyo at a place called the Japanese American Community Services Asian Involvement Office, the first area that I was uh, assigned to, I guess, was working with young people on drugs. And uh, so many issues, and it's cultural, I think, in terms of shame and not wanting, again, you know, things put out in the open and public, you know, like... Um, so when people, younger people were overdosing on drugs, and we had like 31 young people in one year, 1971, I believe, the, the, the reports were all that they had heart attacks. You know, and they were like high school. I know that people that age do not really have heart attacks, you know. So uh, we started a campaign to talk about the fact that we need to bring these to the surface. If we're going to deal with the problem, we have to talk about it. We are not... Uh, you know, we are not um, the, the good, you know, we're not all good students. We're not all getting A's. I was we're not. not you know. <laughs> <laughs> but see, people felt very ashamed and they felt not good about themselves because that was the image that was being thrown out there, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, these kids had a very negative self-image of themselves. And, and then their parents were not, you know, didn't get a lot of support maybe from other people. So we knew that there were a lot of factors playing into this racism, you know, the stereotypes. So we, we really try to bring that out through education in our community and talk um, more with, with, the, with people. You know, and the fact that people needed help on, on welfare, the older folks. Obviously, they came out of camp, they were older. How could they get back on their feet? And there was nothing sh to be shameful, to be ashamed about to get welfare. So we tried to make that an open kind of discussion that it was, it was their right. They worked here, they put money into the government, and, the, and that they deserved welfare. Uh, and then other issues that were problems we tried to bring out. Uh, again, I don't know how good a job we did because I, I hear today that mental health is still kind of a no-no. It's like people don't want to talk about it that much. And we talked, we talked more about mental health at that time too and tried to, tried, to, tried to say it's not an individual problem you know, that people are having. You know, it's caused by a lot of different external things too. Uh, and maybe, you know, so that, that conversation is going on again now. Um, yeah, so those, those are some of the things that, you know, we had to talk about shame. So the older generation, unfortunately, it, it dies hard. You right. know, the idea of shame really, and, it, and it's, I know it's, we were dealing with that when it was like um, the Me Too movement. And we were talking about people, women being abused. It's like, well, no, we can't bring that up because we know that person. And how is it going to, how they're, they're important in the community or, or, you know, well, then how do we deal with it? It's right. not an easy, everybody knows everybody, right? So, <laughs> yeah, it's, so it's hard. Yeah. Mm. And, um, yeah, you don't, you don't like to shame people, and you're not, but how do you, how do you move forward? You know? Right. So, yeah, I, th I think it's like, how do we, right? Like for, like. How, how do you, how do you in this, especially in this moment where we need to be speaking about these issues and it's so at the forefront of so many people's minds, you know, how do you even broach that topic? I think it's easy for us to go on social media, right? And I think for many of us, we're yeah. like literally on social media right now. It's much easier for us to have that conversation here. But how do you do that in person, that, that intimate conversation with your parents who may not understand or your sisters, uncles, aunts? Um, 
what are some nuggets of wisdom that you have learned over the years that have worked for you? <laughs> and what are some things that don't work for you? I don't know if I have nuggets of wisdom on that. I mean, even talking about the camps to my family was not easy. You had to be very careful, you know, it was sort of, uh, and get and step back. You know, if they, it was too, they got too angry. Could you repeat they, that actually, too painful. the step back part? Could you repeat we that about to, the stepping back? <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, you're not going to get anywhere if someone is really uh, very angry or, or, you know, emotional, like, you know, uh, it's just going to be, they're just going to resist and, you know, and it's it just, you know, be, resist you more. You know, I think uh, it took a lot of time. It took a lot of time to be able to talk about the camps with my mother who said, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, a big deal. And then it wasn't so, so bad. And then finally she said it was the worst thing that ever happened to her. So, you know, and then my aunt want to talk about it. And they said, well, don't, don't bring that up. Why are you bringing that up? And it's really, we have to understand why is it so, why was it so painful for them? And I have an uncle today that I was talking to. I said, do you remember the camps? And he said, I don't want to talk about it because it hurt. It's, I was abused and it's too hard for me to talk about. So, mm -hmm. I mean, on that level, there's that. But the, the anti-blackness, um, yeah, that's, that's one, I think... I, I think we have to, I, I don't know how it could be, but, you know, we have to be patient, but we do have to confront, you know, it's kind of like, no, we don't, we don't really agree with that point of view, you know, this is how we see it, but, but you have to, you know, even when I was talking about the comfort women issue with some people, you know, it's like, they said, why do you have to do that? I said, well, you know, I was trying to explain, and, uh, and they said, yeah, I, I do, you know, you, you have to get to a point where they're going to actually listen. You know, right. and people are going to hear what you have to say. Um, and at some point, though, you may have to say, you know what, you're just all wrong. And I don't think we could talk anymore until you look at yourself or something. You know, I mean, it may, it may end that way, you know. Uh, but you have, to, you have to, you know, kind of try it, step back, try it, you know, keep on coming back a little more. Um, I don't know if we have that much time now, though, you know. Because we are right. asking That's the people. Hard part. What, what you're talking a lot about is exerting a lot of patience and yeah. empathy and compassion. But I think it, it's it's something that is learned and, and unbelievably important. And I feel like this conversation that we're having with you is so prevalent right now because you've been fighting this fight for far longer than we have. And many of us, this is our introduction to this fight. Yeah, but this part here, I don't think we have fought. You know, so I think we're going to learn together on this one, you know, uh, from trial and error. I think we'll, we can learn from people like yourself and others who try it with their families. I mean, my parents are gone. I know what my father would say, and I know how, how I would react, <laughs> you know, probably not, not in a very good way. You know what I mean? Um, it, it, would, it, would, it would not be – it's hard to talk to your own parents, frankly. Right. It's probably easier to talk to other people than, than your own family um, and be patient. But I think we really, honestly, I don't know if we've really embarked on that hard discussion and conversation uh, with people in our community, because I could just imagine some of the comments that would be made. And, and um, it would be, it would be um, difficult, you know? Mm. It would be difficult. I, I, I don't know if really, like, punching them in the face is the best thing. Maybe in some <laughs> cases it is. I'm not, not literally, but, you know, just saying, you know. Analogy. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, really being strong about it, or it probably depends on who it is. You know, there are some people you won't change, but yeah. So I have a, I have a, a question that, that comes to mind. So in, here in the Massachusetts um, Asian American Commission, we released a statement supporting the Black Lives Matter movement, and we named the Black Panther Party. We talked about uh, the Dalek Panthers. We talked about um, how the Black... And so that elicited some very, very strong uh, reaction from the older generation, and they were very upset about it. Could you actually talk a little bit about why is it, because if you talk to younger generations, you know, for us, our, our perception of the Black Panther Party is very different. Um, but could you actually um, talk to us a little bit about why is it that older generations have more of a negative reaction to hearing Black Panthers? Um, older generation, do you, what, what age are you talking about, older generation? 
I would say um, the, the, those who, who reacted very poorly are between the ages of 60 and, uh, 60 and above. Yeah, I guess it depends on how active or, or, or they're, when they were here, you know, and, and things like that, right? What, what kind of um, background they have. I mean, for a lot of us that were active in the 60s, uh, we, we, were, we saw what the Black Panthers was, were about. You know, we, in fact, some of the things that they were doing, like the free breakfast program and other serve, serve the people type things, we were trying to emulate in, in the Little Tokyo work, you know, um, and we actually had serve the people programs is what we called it. Uh, you know, and we were, we were really um, saddened and uh, angered by the killings of, of their leaders, you know, um, which, which happened, you know, which they could do in those days, you know, um, because we didn't have the network or people were isolated uh, and they got away with those murders, you know, both in prison and even in the community, you know. So um, we have a different view of the Black Panthers. Even some people, some Asian Americans are part of the Black Panthers, you, right. you know. Uh, but uh, I don't know the other people, the rest of the people of my generation would have felt that way. I know my parents would not have felt that way. They were more fearful, fearful of probably because they feared what could happen to uh, us if, uh, you know, um, if we followed a similar path or feeling that, you know, they, they didn't want violence to come down on us, you know what I mean? So I think it comes out of fear, perhaps, you know, and not understanding the full picture of what people were feeling, what they were going through at that time, um, and the anger that gave rise to the Black Panthers, you know, right. uh, and they don't know what else they did. They just see one picture right. of them. So what do you have to actually say about the narrative that's out there that Asian Americans are silent, that we don't speak up, that we don't fight? Um, you know, what is your response to that? Um, well, I mean, I don't think that's true, at least, uh, you know, of people that I see. And, um, you know, it's funny, somebody said to me that we had a, on the Board of Education here, we had a Asian American, Japanese American guy, Warren Furtani. And even when he spoke, somebody else described, and he was very vocal, he's a very vocal guy. And even, even uh, somebody described him as quiet. And it was sort of like, even if you, even if you speak up, you're seen as quiet. He is not a quiet guy, I've never described him as quiet. So it's sort of like this, this mindset that people have already and they don't let go of it, you know, mm -hmm. or you're not seen, right? We're not seen a lot. That's another thing. Even if we did speak, we're not seen, you know? Um, and so I don't think we're silent. I think we're not seen. And sometimes we, we may be silent. You know, somebody was saying, you know, like we're the, 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 the Sergeant Tao or the officer Tao image of standing there silently, you know, on the side, it's not a good one. You know, I, I don't think not, any of us want to be uh, Officer Tao standing on the side of when someone's being murdered, you know. So, you know, so that, uh, I, I think we do need to speak up more, though, you know. Right, you absolutely. Know. And, and that, to me, that image was so emblematic of all the false, the, the negative stereotypes of the Asian American community. And it felt like, so much of what we what we've been fighting for um especially in the advent and the rise in anti-asian sentiment during COVID 19 that he really just took us 10 steps backward and yeah. Yeah. um and so for you like you know for me that was incredibly frustrating to watch um but how do we you know how do we break break out of this notion that the asian americans are a monolith like we're like how do we build solidarity but also get people to understand that we're not a monolith? Hmm. Um, well, I think we all, all of us need to learn more about each other, you know, other, other APIs and Asian American uh, groupings so that we can share the story, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, promote and, I guess, uplift the, the stories of other, other communities. Uh, I mean, our story has been told a lot, even though people still don't know it, uh, about the camps. 
but um, it's not the only story. So I think that it would be good if we could learn more about other, other APIs in our own, you know, as a group. But sometimes mm -hmm. we do have to act together, right? We do want right. to. Yeah. So that's being a model. This might not be a bad thing if people saw us as strong and united. You know, I mean, I know you mean mono as all the same. No, we're not all the same. Yeah. So how do, so how would you also like what is what is the the trajectory been? So as more different, um, you know, different country people from different countries start immigrating and and they're looped into the umbrella of the Asian American community. How have you seen that change, and what has that um, change that progression been been like? Well. Um, I think in LA we have so many different, a, you know, API groups, right? Some centered, you know, in um, concentrated, closer together, you know, some out in like the Long Beach area or you know, Orange County. But uh, one of the good things is that we have this we have this program called Summer Activist Training, which is training of activists, and it reaches all the different uh, API groups mostly, you know. And people come together and they learn about their communities and what communities are doing in terms of issues and struggles. And I think that it is, it is really, it's been going on since 1992 or three, started by the, by Kiwa, Korean Immigrant Workers um, Advocates, I think. Cause they, anyway, and then other groups joined on like uh, NCRR and uh, Thai CDC and PWC, Filipino Workers Center, and then more, more have come on. I, I can't name them all because I'm not working with them currently, but, you know, uh, it has expanded as communities have come in and, and uh, started to grow and be more aware. And the younger people have said, we want to, we don't think the same as our, our parents and maybe we have different values and, and do, you know, we, issues we want to deal with. So that training has been really great to uh, bring people together, at least of that generation, younger people. And it has it's served as a network for people to keep in touch and to know about each other's issues and struggles and to support each other. Uh, we don't necessarily have that among the older generation, uh, but I, you know, that's why we have to learn from the younger, the younger people um, about those things. And um, yeah, so I, I point that out as an example of something that really is building a good solidarity foundation, you know. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't really have the answer to do, and I don't think we've done as good a job in our generation, maybe, of uh, of reaching out. And so we always have to be reminded of that. Um, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. Some some in ways. our community are very good. Hmm? It goes both ways. I, I think that for, for those in the younger generations, you know, that we have to understand and make sure that there's room created that for for those who paved the road before us, and it would be um, irresponsible of us to not respect that, to not to understand that, and um, be 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 more patient and and know that maybe there are things that we just learned about that we need to understand more. And so that being said, if you could go, I, and I want I would like to also remind people if you want to ask some questions for Kathy, please submit them into the question section, where it's like a question mark bar, and I'll try to get to them. But, you know, Kathy, if you could um, go back to a younger version of yourself and impart some, a piece of knowledge, what would, is, there, is there anything that comes to mind that you would really want to, to know back then? Um, well, I, I think I would have to say that, uh oh, there's a plane flying over. Uh, I would have to say that a lot of us were impatient. Uh, I mean, you know, you're young, you're impatient. A lot of us thought that everything was going to change or that revolution was tomorrow, you know, mm -hmm. that we were, um, and I don't think we had a grasp of the long term. Uh, and so I think, um, you know, but, you know, so some people got discouraged and frustrated and, and uh, you know, left, left being active. Uh, I don't know. You know, it's like, I feel like, but then again, today, it's kind of, again, um, there's a chance to actually do, do more things. So it's, I didn't think in my lifetime that we would see a day like today or what's going on today, both with COVID, but also with 
you know, Black Lives Matter and the uh, upsurge of people being involved and people thinking that activist now is a positive word. I mean, activist before was not a positive word. You know, mm-hmm. it wasn't like people thought, oh, you're an activist, great. No. In fact, it was like, well, I, you would not want to say you're an activist, actually. You know, Why was you had that? a certain con- Well, it had a connotation of being um, sort of like all you do is protest, all you do is uh, you're not really. Um, you're not going to really get, it's, it's a lot of shouting, a lot of uh, anger, but not necessarily, you're not being realistic, I guess. I don't know. Kind of uh, way back, you know, kind of, uh, or you're too radical. And people are not afraid of those words today. Even using the word revolution sort of, you know, we, it, was, it meant a lot, you know, we, when we used it back in the 60s. And people use it today, it's like, oh, okay, I guess it's not so you know, extreme. Um, yeah, but um, yeah. So what would I say to my younger self? Just that you never know. You never know what's going to happen, you know, as far as uh, keep on plugging. And, you know, we did because we had no other choice to keep on plugging. But uh, maybe I would have said to myself, do more, you know, uh, take a risk. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, don't accept it. It's kind of like if I, as I'm reflecting back on Black Lives Matter and the fact that we kind of knew these things. There was, there was police violence back in the 60s and there were groups that were fighting it, you know, uh, especially in the black community, right? And, but we didn't really uh, take it to heart, I guess. You know, like how, what it really meant. Maybe there was, I don't know if there was so much going on or what, but... Um, Maybe I was too young to quite grasp the depth of it, but, uh, you know, really taking, maybe other people took it on, and I was just naive, but, you know, you know, if, if we had taken things a little more, I don't know if we could have, though. The times are, the times, I do want to say that I was active at a time when many people were active. It wasn't like I was unusual, you know what I mean? It, the times do give rise to people being active, and uh, the situation and circumstances. So um, now, now these, these things are happening. It maybe not have happened before, right? You know, this kind of uh, uprising. Yeah. Hey, I did hey, want to you... say one other, yes, one other thing, Sam. I just want to say an example of, uh, of uh, working together as APIs. And, and uh, I work with a group called Little Turkey Service Center, too. And I really am quite proud of that organization because it's a group that is Japanese American, but it has uh, really reached out and supported other organizations like in housing, affordable housing, very concrete, very real. You know, the Thai community, the Korean American community, the Filipino community. So they have buildings of affordable housing and they have spaces for their organizations as well. So uh, the philosophy is to really rise, raise up other groups. They had the skills, they had the support resources and they spread that around. Um, and, and other communities as working with other communities. I think it's a, and with the non-Asian communities, the African-American black community and the Latinx community. So I think those are examples of what community groups can do. And that's really powerful um, right there at the end where you're talking about that's, that's racial solidarity between different minority groups and, and can, you know, and that's not new, right? So you, that you saw, and, and that was so important to pu- pushing the, uh, movement forward, especially for Asian Americans. So could you actually talk more about that? Well, uh, you know, like I said, we really learned from uh, the black movement, black power movement, and uh, black is beautiful. And I think we owe a lot to the to the black community, black movement for that. And even today, right, they're kind of leading the charge, which is, un- which is of course, fully understandable. And um, uh, you know, learning from them, the kind of things that they did. Uh, we also, you know, we felt that our struggles were like we were rooted in our community. It was, we called it a national struggle for, you know, our community as you know, Japanese Americans or APIs. But it was also a third world movement. So of uh, people of color, a third world that was going to be really making the change, the national movements of people. While we each worked in our communities, we felt that we were tied together and would be powerful because we saw ourselves as the racism was really what was, what was generating this energy and that we were tied together by that. You know, we looked at other countries 
you know, in Africa who were also fighting racism, colonization, and throwing off the colonizers and getting inspiration from them. So, uh, I mean, early on, those are kind of the influences and the thinking that we had. And I, I guess it's not a bad thinking, you know. I think it still holds true. Uh, you know, it's not the only force because, you know, there are many other people that are part of the equation that are suffering and are marginalized. So I don't want to say that it's just, you know, um, people of color. Uh, you know, it's poor, poor people too. But mm -hmm. I think that the racism mm -hmm. is definitely a thing that ties us, ties us together, you know, and gives us, you know, a, ability to unite. You we know, have a great so, question in the comment section. Okay. So uh, Tracy has asked, could you speak on yellow power versus peril? Um, and she says that it is, is misused today. Well, I mean, I, I didn't quite understand when I saw yellow peril a sign because that was really a negative, a derogatory term that was used um, against uh, people, yellow people, you know. Uh, definitely during World War II, we were called the yellow peril and probably Chinese Americans before that. You know, the people that were bringing plague or uh, the people that were going to sabotage or that could not in assimilate. We were, we were not, it was very, a very negative term. We were danger. So right. to use yellow peril was like, I guess if you want to turn it around, we are, but I don't know. I kind of feel like I don't really want to be a peril. I mean, <laughs> that's not really the <laughs> kind of description I would prefer. Yellow power, yeah, because that's, you know, we want, we want to feel our strength and power. But uh, I don't think we want to necessarily be, I don't know. That that was that kind of threw me off when I saw that yellow peril. Mm. Um, it 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 doesn't carry the same. I'd have to hear what other people have to say about that. What's the, what's the purpose, you know, of using that? Yeah. Yeah, I'd be really interested to hear it too because my understanding that is also it was or originated during when the Chinese migrant workers were brought here to build the railroads, and that was used as a way to discredit and also then ban all Chinese migration to the United States, right? You, you create the other and you, and you make them dangerous and um, continue to perpetuate really dangerous stereotypes that are not true. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Nina, Nina, yep, please, please. No, go ahead. Um, I was going to say, um, there's another question, but if you want to um, add on to that, that um, by all means. No, no, I don't. I want to hear the other question. question, Sam. Okay, so Nina, so Nina asks, uh -oh. um, how has your identity changed in the times as an Asian American woman? How has it changed? Or has it um, not? Well, I think I've just learned more. And I feel like we've had, as Japanese Americans, maybe more in particular, and maybe every, every uh, group has to go through this. Um, I, oh, I, I'm not sure really how to explain this. Uh, we have to sort of, every time something happens, it makes us sharpen our identity. You know, it's, uh, we've gone through a lot, you know, like, you know, whenever Japan did anything, then we would suffer the repercussions here. And we'd have to kind of, again, try to define ourselves to other people. And, um, you know, at the same time, fight the racism that was coming out, you know, and the same thing with COVID, right? But, you know, and, and when, when this country, the workers were suffering and the, the car factories were closing, they would blame Japan and the cars. And then, they would, you know, mass smash the cars, and then they'd look at, you know, Vincent Chin, of course, is an example. Um, and so we'd have to, we'd have to fight that. And then, you know, when Japan was, uh, they had this, Sanrio had uh, a, a toy or a doll that was kind of mimicking um, a black person. And, you know, we had to deal with that, the racism mm -hmm. that was coming from Japan now towards mm -hmm. people of color or their mis misstatements or not misstatements, their racist statements about people here. Um, so we've had to define ourselves. I don't, I don't want to say Japan because it's Japanese government and certain officials. I, I want to think that the Japanese people don't really think 
the same way. But, um, you know, um, in terms of, of the comfort women and the issue of, of seeing, of really apologizing to them for the role that Japan played. It doesn't mean Japan is a bad guy now, but, but certainly was a bad guy then and needs to apologize directly to the women. And they refuse to do that. And it's, um, I mean, I guess it's easy to understand and it's hard to understand, you know, um, they, but, but um, I don't want to be, t be caught up in defending Japan on that at all. You know, that's not where we come from, especially having fought for redress for Japanese Americans. So it's kind of like um, we've had to define ourselves define our values and make clear distinctions on who we are and what we support, you know? Um, so things like that, um, uh, you know, and I mean, we're always learning who, what, what we are as Asian Americans. Um, yeah. And I, like I said, it's also the changing face of Asian Americans. We're not, you know, it's uh, ethnically or I don't know if it's ethnically, but it was just a, uh, uh, a developing community. We always talk about what is, uh, what is the community going to be like years from now, you know, because I think we're, we're changing a lot faster probably as Japanese Americans and other groups, mm -hmm. but um, there's still, there's still that tie. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's almost been an hour. And so and to respect the, the time, and we actually only have an hour. So I, I really want to open it up to, is there any, you know, a, tell us more about exactly what you're doing today, right? Give us a little bit more insight how we could support you and the work that you are doing. I think it's really important for the viewers out there. Well, I'd like people to check out, um, you know, uh, Nikki Progressives and also Vigilant Love and also uh, Nikki for Civil Rights and Redress. But uh, as far as um, Vigilant Love is, uh, you know, the, it's, it's really solidarity with the Muslim community. And I think this is kind of a significant thing is that they have to fight a lot of surveillance. They face a lot of like the ban, uh, you know, um, uh, and, and other, uh, other ways that the government has monitored them. And, uh, you know, so there's a, there's a project called Service, Service is Not Surveillance. And it's kind of important because if you're in the mental health field, the Department of uh, Homeland Security is using really the mental health area and services there to really surveil people, not just Muslims, mm. but many people. So when we talk about, you know, uh, mental health as being a good thing, which it is, we have to be very careful where the funds come from because then reporting goes back to the Department of Homeland Security. So that's an area that people can maybe pay attention to. But Nikki Progressives has been doing a lot of immigrant support work, both with the Latinx community, Haitian community, over here in California and trying to get the detention centers to be um, either shut down, free them all, or at least releasing people because of COVID. It's so bad at the detention centers. And also supporting the, uh, like I said, the Southeast Asian um, uh, prisoners, at, especially at San Quentin where COVID is also very bad. But a lot of them are facing, when they re get released, they're facing deportation as well. So there's a commissary fund because uh, they don't have anything when they get out. So funds are necessary for, for them. Um, you know, you might want, this might be controversial, but affirmative action uh, in California <laughs> is back on the ballot and we want to get rid of 209, which, uh, which uh, you know, really eliminated uh, looking at affirmative action, using for affirmative action. We would support affirmative action here. So there's a bill that people can look at, AB 3121, and um, supporting Black Lives Matter. You know, we are feeding the revolution with uh, funds. Uh, they have their meetings and things like that and supporting black reparations. We're starting to look at that a little more closely. That's gonna be a huge, huge effort, I think. Um, and also getting out the vote. We got to vote in November. I'm not gonna say how you should vote, but I hope you vote a certain way. <laughs> but you know, um, I, and this is my personal opinion. I honestly feel like we're being, we're being, you know, we're being killed really by, uh, by this, by the, by the powers that we're being allowed to die. And it's really a crime that um, so many Asian American API health workers are being put on the line and not supported really in the way that they should be, you know, so it's kind of disheartening 
makes you angry and we've got to make a change, mm. you know? So, um, I think those are some of the things that we're, we're talking about and, um, hope that we could, could work on. And on that note, is there any last words that you would like to give to the, to the viewers? Um, and I, cause you just, wow, that was really powerful. Well, I want to say we do have to learn a lot from younger people. And, you know, sometimes the language and jargon, we don't always understand. We talked about that and terms. And, um, you know, while I think younger people need to break it down for us as older people uh, and people, too, because I don't think everybody uses those words necessarily. So breaking down terms. But at the same time, I think uh, as an older person that maybe resists wanting to, uh, you know, learn something new all the time. I think uh, opening my, my mind and my ears to what I have to learn uh, in terms of terms. Like, I have a hard time using some of the jargon, to be honest. But, uh, you know, but we have to communicate. The point is to communicate and to learn from each other. I love that. So, yeah. I love that. I think that's such an excellent way to, to end this because we're at a point where we're never going to move forward. We're never going to be able to heal if we aren't creating dialogue and if we aren't communicating and if we aren't listening to understand. And I just really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, you know, of how candid you've been, how you've shared your experience. I've, there's no way you can walk away from this conversation and not have grown and been a better person and with better perspective and understanding. And so Kathy, I, I just want to, I'm going to you know, take it upon myself to speak for all the viewers that we want to thank you for all the work you have done and continue to do. And, and really just appreciate all the sacrifice and love that you have poured into this community. Can I thank you, Sam, and Hate is a Virus, and all of you who have done a lot to support Little Tokyo and Black Lives Matter and all the other groups that you support. So uh, support Hate is a Virus. <laughs> <laughs> and we're only going to get through this if we do this together. And, and that means we need to have, like as Kathy said, we need to have those tough conversations. We need to open up our hearts. We need to listen to understand and we need to have more empathy and compassion. And with that being said, I'd like to, to end this, this live. And if we could all just say a big massive thank you, I want to throw this message up there because this came from one of our viewers. Um, it says, no question. Just want to thank you for sharing your experiences and wisdom with us. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. And to all those, who have watched, thank you for joining us tonight. It's been just an amazing, amazing time in which we've all learned and grown so much. Please also remember that this is part of a bigger movement of our Raise a Million campaign, where we're aiming to raise a million dollars. And so every two, week, um, two weeks, we'll be having another live. Keep Continue to follow us, continue to follow Kathy. We're gonna be posting all the information so you can help her organizations with the work that she is doing and keep fighting. Stay up, keep your, keep your head up. This fight is not over and as Kathy shared, this is, a lot, this is something that's going to happen, not overnight, but step by step, chip by chip, we're going to chip away and we're going to get there together. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you, everybody. Oh.